This was the first saw we ever made. It's called a quick saw, direct drive unit. Direct drive. So whatever speed the motor turned at, say 20,000 RPMs, that's how fast the blade went. That's correct. It went fast, but no power, no torque. No torque, so. So the next year, we decided to put some gearing in it. Mm -hmm. And this is the Speedomatic, and this was the front runner in the first helical drive saw. Feel it. Whoa. That is heavy. How much does that weigh? 16 pounds. Yeah, you'd be tired at the end of the day handling yeah, you know, this. Your arm definitely knows it. The one you've got in your shop is a little different. Made out of magnesium, about 10 and a quarter pounds. Lighter and, and a lot more powerful. A lot more powerful. About twice as powerful as the earlier saws. Love to see one of these made. Just so happens that we're making that saw in the plant today. Why don't we go out there? Okay. okay. This is where it all begins, Norm. This is our bar stock inventory. We truck this inventory in from all over the United States to make parts. Mm-hmm. You got some good sized bars of steel here. Look at this one. Wow. That's yeah, about 300 pounds. And what's a piece like that cost? About a dollar a pound. So it's good quality steel. Yes, very, very good quality. We take different size bars and we turn them into parts that look like this. Okay, so now this is a shaft for the saw that you're building? That's a shaft that's in the saw. Let me take you over and let you see where it's being machined. Norm, this is a computer controlled bar machine. Inside this long tube is a piece of that bar stock steel like mm -hmm. this. And it's spinning at about 600 RPM. It is fed out of that tube into a collet and into a machining center. Now we've got the door open and we're dry cycling it right now. Otherwise, we'd have coolant all over us. As you can see, in the turret are about eight different tools. Each one of them is doing a specific operation on that part. Now let me get Keith over here to turn on the machine and let you see what's happening. Uh, Jim, is this an oil lubricant in there? No, actually it's water soluble. If and if you didn't have that, I suppose your tools would wear down very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, each of those tools uh, would, would, would wear down in a matter of minutes because of the heat and friction. And how many a day will you make on this machine of that little shaft? In three shifts, we'll make about 1,500 a day. Wow. Norm, let me show you another computer control machine. This is a computer control gear hob. What we do is take a part like that mm -hmm. and turn it into a part that looks like this. Oh, that's a gear. Is this for the gear reduction in the that's saw? That's right. When we talked about earlier, we needed to add power to that direct drive saw. This is what does it. It's machined on this gear hob in an oil bath. It's robotically loaded and unloaded at about 55 parts an hour. Mm -hmm. After the part is made, we want to make sure that it's a good part. So we bring it over to a very roll machine, which takes a master gear that's perfect and checks it against the part we just did. We have a tolerance of about two thousandths of an inch. And you can see on our monitor over here that it's basically staying right in the middle of that tolerance band, which means it's a very good part. And if it doesn't, it gets rejected? Absolutely. Rejected and another part's made. Now I'd like to turn our attention to the outside of the saw. And the first thing we got to do is put a good coat of paint on our casting. What you've got coming in here are die castings from our supplier in Sparta, Illinois. Feel that. It's still warm. Yeah. Just came out of the washer. So you got rid of any oil that was on it. Right. Got to clean the part. So it's clean now. What next? Well, take a look in here. You'll see the part is being painted. Now, is that a liquid? No, it's a powder. Very fine ground powder that's electrically charged to the part. Now, you said it's electrically charged. What does that mean? OK, let me just explain. What we've got here is powder that's in a very fine stage. Boy, that is fine. Almost like a face powder that a woman would use. Mm -hmm. The powder itself, then, is charged electrically and given a negative charge. We then ground the part through a grounding system which attracts the powder to the part. And you can see the powder is all over the part. But it's on there very loosely. So well, what happens next? Well, we have to then get it hard. So we send it into an oven. Boy, I can feel the heat in here. Yeah, about 400 degrees. Well, why so hot? Well, that powder is a, an epoxy. And when it reaches 400 degrees, it will turn into a liquid and then immediately turn into a solid. But why use this process? Why not just spray them or dip them in paint? Well, a couple of reasons. The first one is, that we get about 98% of that powder 
either on the part or recycled for using it. The second thing is we don't have any of those nasty solvents that are out there. So it's environmentally safe. Absolutely environmentally safe. And the other reason, let me show you over here. The whole process takes about 45 minutes from start to finish. Here's the finished part. Looks great. It's a great paint job. Well, it's also something else. Why don't you drop it on the floor? I wouldn't do that, Jim. It'll ruin the sure, paint job. Sure, go ahead and drop it. It won't hurt a thing. You hmm. can see it didn't damage the part at all. A little bit of... A little just... bit of smudge off the floor, but no crack in the, in the paint at all. That's amazing. So what's the advantage of that? Well, let me show you. The next step is we have to machine the part. In the old days, we would have machined the part in the raw casting form, then we would have masked the machined area, and then we would have painted it. A lot of extra steps. Today, all we have to do is paint it and machine it. So this part actually went into a machine like we saw earlier. It got soaked with oil. It was clamped in place, yet it shows no signs of scratches. That's correct. That's how tough it is. That's amazing. Norm, in the old days, when we had to check a part like this, we would have to take a whole table full of gauges. And an individual would have to take that gauge and place it in a bore like this. Gets a reading. Make a measurement, write it down somewhere, and do a whole group of these. And all these tools are really only good for that one part, right? That's correct. About $23,000 worth of gauges, and we only get one part. Hmm. Takes about eight hours. Wow. Today, we're fortunate. We've got a tool that we get in Providence, Rhode Island from Brown and Sharp that is a computer-controlled measuring machine that can measure all parts. It's mounted on a granite base. It has an articulating robotic head with a ruby tip on it. Wait a minute. This little red speck on the end of that needle is a ruby tip? That's correct. That's a ruby. And it's going to probe the part? It's going to probe in the part. And as it's probing, it will lodge all the information into the computer and tell us whether it's good or bad. OK, Ricky, why don't we show him how it works? As you can see, Norm, the articulating head is taking the ruby probe and touching different areas of the part. Oh, so it's checking, like, the flatness of where parts meet. That's correct. And uh, it'll do all the inside diameters, it'll anything you all, want. Anything you want. Anything you can program into the computer, it will check. Wow. And how are we doing? Well, you can see, Norm, some of the dimensions are in tolerance. Those are the ones in green. Mm -hmm. Some of the dimensions are out of tolerance. Those are the ones in red. Well, there are a couple problems with this part, so what are you going to do with it? Well, this is just a test one, and it took us a long time to make this part. So we'll throw this one away. So this is just a demonstration for the show, right? That's correct. Let's go make an engine for this thing. OK. Norm, when you were a kid, did you ever make an electric motor? I sure did. It was pretty simple, but I know all the principles are the same and the part names. This would be the armature. Yeah, that's correct. It has copper windings on it. It slides through a field, which also has copper windings on it. And on one end, there's a commutator. And when you put a set of brushes up against it, which receive power, uh, you get an opposing magnetic field, and it makes it spin. That's exactly right. Let's take a look at how we make that armature. The first thing we do is machine a shaft, as we saw on the other side of the plant. We take a group of metal discs that we call lamination, and a double in, and an insulating tube, and we press them all together right over here. Mm -hmm. The next step is we take a roll of insulating paper and we cut it into slot and stuff it into slots of the armature. Okay. And that's what's happening right here. I can see the pieces of paper being pushed through the that's slot. That's correct. They're being folded and inserted in each one of those slots. Norm, this is where we press the commutator on the shaft. Well, what's next, Jim? Well, the next station is the winding station. This is where we put the copper wire in the slot. Well, what kind of wire is that? Well, it's a special copper alloy that's got an insulating coating over the outside of it. So this machine has to do a lot of work. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing machine. In the old days, what we had to do is take hand winders, and each one of those slots was wound by hand and, in, and put in by an individual. So it's uh, almost like the woolen industry, weaving something. Very similar. We use a needle and a bobbin and a thread, and only the thread happens to be copper. At this station, we're diamond turning the commutator to make it perfectly round. 
so it's like a little lathe. Yeah, just a miniature lathe. The next operation is spin balancing. So that's not unlike getting the tires balanced on my automobile. That's correct. You spin the part up to speed, and we check to see if it's out of balance. Because if it had vibration, the tool would vibrate off. That's right. We take it off, we put it in a mill, and mill out that out of balance condition, and we use our computer to make sure we're right. Great. We're now entering our assembly area. This is where we take all the components that we saw in the front of the plant, mm -hmm. all of our suppliers' parts, and bring them in and start assembly operations. Terry's in the first operation, and she's putting the motor housing together and putting the field, the brush holders, and the bearing into the end of that housing. After she puts the brush holders in, she puts it into another press and presses the field into place. She's now connecting the brush holder spring. And everything goes together at one time when the press bottoms out. Next, Ryan is going to assemble the base to the motor housing. Norm, this is an interesting station. This is where we run and test all of our tools. So you actually test every single tool that comes off the line? Every single tool gets tested. Brandy takes the tool off the end of the line. She puts it inside of a run-in booth. So all of these saws are running? Every one of them are running for about 20 minutes. Wow. It allows us to break the saw in and get the, get the gears seated and so forth. She then takes the saw out of run-in, puts it on the test bench, and checks to make sure that there's no ground fault or problems electrically. She then starts a visual check to make sure all the saw operational parts actually do what they're intended to do. The guards actually guard and the springs actually work. Mm -hmm. She then checks the squareness of the blade to the base in several places because you do get run out in a blade. Mm -hmm. If it meets all those specs, she then plugs it in and checks the RPM. So if it doesn't run at the right speed, it's going to get rejected. Absolutely. Once she determines the RPM and that the saw is good, she'll put an inspection tag on it and we'll box it. Great. Well, you know, Jim, I've probably picked up a circular saw a couple hundred thousand times in my lifetime. The next time I pick one up, I'm really going to remember this day. Well, Norm, we appreciate you being here and thanks for coming. I really enjoyed it. And that, Tommy is how they build our circular saws. Well, I think I'll stick to building houses. Looks a lot easier. I agree. All right, now for the lesson on how to trim out the exterior of this window.